Uh, hi there, we've no lockdown festival and everything, and I'm um, M.W. Buick, and um, I, I write some poetry, um, as well as being um, a writer of all different types, like a, uh, a journalist and various other things. Anyway, um, welcome to my um, uh, little office, my Zoom space, um, for when I'm at work, um, and... I thought I might as well, since I'm sat here quite a lot, also read some poetry from here. Um, and I've got a um, a new book out in the last few weeks um, called Poems Flixus. Um, you know, I don't even know if this is being mirrored back to front for you guys or not. Anyway, this is Poems Flixus. Um, and I just thought I'd read a few poems for uh, 10 minutes or so from here. Um, and some of them are kind of... Uh, a bit sort of suburban and some of them are kind of very much in transit and there's uh, poems about being on trains and things like that um, some of them are really obvious what they're about and some of them aren't so obvious about what they're about but they've got a nice feel about them hopefully um, so don't worry about you know um, about everything to do with them just just enjoy hearing some poetry I suppose this first one I thought I'd read was definitely about being in Wivenhoe and looking out of the um, uh, of, our, uh, of our, our front window onto our little street. Um, this was written last year when it had been really hot for ages in the um, in the summer, um, and it's called "Here's That Rainy Day," which is also a um, a jazz standard, uh, in part made famous by uh, the jazz guitarist Wes Montgomery. Um, so yeah, here's that rainy day. As we look out to a little street, all the parked commuter cars, the houses there beyond the river, that feeling that summer never quite got going, but here, with a view, after all, of our occasional need for ease and quiet, content in a kind of neutral mid-tempo, but also finding reason in a quickness unfolding around us where the drains fill with a thirst of ages and the hydrangeas by the corner are almost insanely thankful the birds instantly much quieter heading for the birches and false acacias things that know best how to handle these moments all round the ringed roads of the estate like coaxial thoughts that desired being straightened or vertical like rain, forgetting that rain has its inflections, or that sometimes there's little between rain and drenched air, all deep wet for something that needs us without regret and feels effortless as a soft voice falling in a shower of notes. So that's one very, uh, very close to home. Um, I didn't grow up in Wivenhoe. I grew up at the uh, far other end of the country, just at the edge of the, the Lake District. And there's a poem in here that I wrote a few years ago um, that really recalls kind of going back to your, your childhood home and, um, and looking at it again and not really being able to... Um, you know, you're seeing it with the same eyes, but you're not really seeing it with the same eyes. And it was about trying to take a photograph of um, an old family home. Uh, so this is about a home up in the edge of the Lake District, just looking out onto the Irish Sea, um, with uh, Scorfell on, on one side on the horizon, and uh, in between uh, Sellafield Windscale, um, which was the, uh, the big factory employer up there. Uh, used to be the view from from my bedroom window. Um, it's just called a viewfinder. The pasture greyed, the rattling beck mute behind secondary glazing, the fizz of pylons too, in a day of scarce light. The aperture of a former home is as wide as the hours require. And each year now we shovel our signifiers, brushing leaves across our yards as the wind lifts. But there is no wind. 
beyond the old neighbour's place, twenty on foot and four in the car, an ombre smudge of tones settles, hawthorn sodden, briars sagging, and mud deep, kicked up by cows gone to the byre for milking, or fell sheep, if there were sheep. The power station, a blackened copse, somewhere around the edge of land, fading, its cooling towers merged with the vapours that lift, sink, sink as the sea of Hibernia turns away, its back brushing the pile of exhausted chimneys, almost gone, almost deconstructed, concrete follies of a folly in a half-life of feeding families now lost in their own decommission. Kids now, all grown up with kids of their own, and those kids with kids. In this, the division between subject and object, ambiguity felt as uncommon knowledge as our own approximate selves, knowledge frozen to make fear dormant, fear of nothing, foam surfing across the pebbles, the air still, and no new windmills turning beyond our vision. This attenuated point between fog and rain, beyond where the trees stood, the trees cut down where the west is lost to water. The invisible men who packed the market squares gone back south for new contracts, their rented terraces at the edge of towns, vacant, earth settling from that last ploughing, our minding of this, recurring, seen through a blue filter and smear of Vaseline, clearing some hairs from before your eyes, taking photos on an old SLR as if we lived here, still, a next horizon never really reached only ever encountered in thought. Now, I grew up in a really small village that makes women who look like something of a metropolis. Um, so let's find something else. Um, there's a lot of, there's some poems about people, I suppose, and voices and I thought that uh, I'd read a, a kind of silly one, really. And this is called Some Comments on Fred Frith. Fred Frith is like an avant-garde jazz guitarist. He does strange things with his guitar um, sometimes. And and um, and he, um, I don't know really much about him. And it doesn't really matter if we know anything or nothing about him. And I realise this is now the second jazz guitar player I'm mentioning today, um, as if I like jazz guitar players. But that's the kind of way that the, the book came together, just going down strange little avenues. Um, so Fred Frith is a guitar player. And what I did to create this poem was actually just go on YouTube and I was looking things up and um, and uh, I was going through the below the line comments basically about Fred Frith. And there's a lot of found comments and kind of found phrases and language from different places in this book. So this one's actually language picked up from, you know, those rubbishy kind of YouTube comments. Um, even I don't know what some of these mean, but I find them quite amusing. Um, so this is some comments on Fred Frith. Fred's dad was a headmaster at the school I attended. My parents bought me some shelves from Fred's dad through a small ad in the local paper. Turns out they'd been Fred's shelves. I had Fred's shelves in my bedroom. They were really good shelves too. Fred makes me proud. He sounds so fresh and incredibly modern and timeless like peanut butter. Fred is polar, south and north. I met Fred in Melbourne in 93 and he did a fabulous show with his ping pong balls and strings. Fred is always arriving somewhere. He is fantastical, signature, 
trailblazing. Fred looks like Woody Guthrie or some mysterious individual in a top ten list of the strangest photographs ever taken. Oh, he is incredibly beautiful. But I can't find him in any of the usual haunts. Please help me find Fred. Um, there's one about Philip Glass, there's one about uh, the Booker Prize winner James Kelman. Um, here's one about, um, it sounds like it's about a real person, I think the thoughts are about right, but actually in this spirit of mixing up the way that we, we write poems, um, this is actually created by taking a poem and putting it like about 40 times through Google Translate and seeing what came out of it. And obviously you have to kind of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, interfere with it a bit to make sense, kind of. But there's some bits in this that don't quite make sense. Um, but uh, that's the fun bit. And it's just called Old Items. Between your fingers and neck, I can see the end of the evening and how the lightning will play across our worldly concerns like music for children. You find me here as she comes to need medical knowledge, how she tires at last. Be careful. Success here means nothing but that our lines are clear or else about food, how her hands grow cool. Though with God, it is said, and this is pure. And then one day my father began to change his diet. He wore summer things and I opened a window. If there is sound advice, he said, it is that work is good and don't Think of paradise or things afar. Those old items can be removed, is what he said. But we are both of us birds, and I am not happy. And um, I think that I'll just do one more to finish off. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and... I think that I'll just finish with a, a poem called Like an Overcoat, which is kind of sets the tempo for, for this book. Um, really, thanks for listening and thanks for everyone who's been doing stuff today. Thanks most of all to Callie, who's been a proper force throughout the last few months for getting this stuff together. Um, so, you know, thanks, Callie. Um, and thanks, everybody. Um, and this is just a thing about generally being kind of finding miserableness when you, you know, even in happiness. Um, and it's called like an overcoat. You know when something's comfortable and, um, you know, it's the place you go to. Um, here's like an overcoat and thanks very much. I can find it anywhere in discomfort after eating a pleasurable meal or the repetitive strain of what's financially viable. Hours that flash about my shoulders in an unexpected sunlit evening. And seeing that you and I seem to have arrived here wondering whether this latest series of perambulations really looks so enchanted anymore. Or whether it's best to be forgotten, because at least that means something occurred. That got the oxygen circulating and the stair carpet worn. And so the sounds of our success is a series of slams of doors becoming concentric as we reinvestigate them, each more sacred and more us with every echo, discovering at best we are a smoothed stone emitting ripples across an autumn pond they say exists for those who have read the right books, or sentences like that, which we would like to dismantle, which means perhaps we are the circles, not the stone. Perhaps we need new means of measuring our reach. And that these kinds of questions, of course, also become the attic leisure, the supermarket necessity, where other questions hide. Hooked and railed on a rack in a narrow hall, what was always likely is now certain. 
not that it feels like much, but insistent, and everywhere. The repeated checks of the thermostat, the loss of concentration at the merest sighting, the gaze into the mirror, the unmet mortality of tomorrow. Thanks very much. Cheerio everyone, have a good day.